Anin Jason Dejnikaz, did you go to a residential school? Yes, I did. Is that all you want to know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <clears throat> when, when I was five, my older sister was six and a half, and my younger sister was four. I think that's around that age that our parents took us to Spanish Ontario and to the girls' residential school there. And uh, my dad must have had it in the back of his mind that we needed to learn English, read it and speak it and write it so that we would be successful off the reserve. Like he knew that um, we wouldn't be staying on the reserve all the time. So in order to be a nurse or a teacher or a doctor or a lawyer, you need to have those skills, those English skills. You have to know how to read it and write it really good to be successful in any career. So in the back of his mind, he must have thought they have to learn English. And the only place there was was the residential school to send us. We didn't stay there for four years straight. We went home at Christmas time and we went home in the summertime. So we didn't lose connection with our families at home, our families in our community. At residential school, their mission was to do away with our language and to give us English language. And they did it in a severe type of way. Okay, when we went there, we didn't know English and we were just amazed at this nice parlor we went in. Our parents brought us in with our little suitcases. And it was just like the floors were like marble. And we were just in awe. Like we were five and six years old, remember? How many of you have five and six year old sisters and brothers? Yes, they're small. <clears throat> so when we were brought into the residential school there in Spanish, um, we were in awe about this place. I've never seen, we've never seen floors like that. And furniture was just shiny. And then we turn around and our parents are gone. And right away we started to cry. And right away we got hit because we're not supposed to cry. And right away we started speaking our language like, where's my mommy, where's my daddy in our language? Because we didn't know English, remember? And right away we get the strap. So their mission was to do away with our language, the way we are, to do away with us as Nishnabe people. They wanted to create an English person, an English speaking person. So they cut our hair, like we had nice long hair, they would cut it, I had little bangs here. I got a picture of me when I was small. And uh, they took our clothes and gave us the clothes to wear. We got the strapping. It was a big strap like that. Wham, you know. And I think I was bound and determined, I'm going to keep my language. I spoke it all the time. I don't remember how many times I got the strapping. After a while, my hand would automatically go like that. You know, as soon as I know I spoke the language, I would go like that waiting for the strap, which I usually got. It was either that or pulling your ear, you know. It wasn't good. So there's ways to acquire a language. There's the additive bilingualism. <clears throat> you add a language in a good way. You have to embrace the person, uh, the person that wants to acquire a second language, you have to embrace their first language, which wasn't done there in residential school. Theirs was to do away with our language. So they did everything they could for you. So a lot of the kids didn't speak their language. And to this day, they won't. Some of those who are lucky to be alive still will not speak the language, those who knew the language when they went there. So I just wanted to share, I missed that part. There's somebody who uh, inquired about the residential school. So I hope when we, ha when we have our immersion school in Garden River, 
we will embrace the English language of the kids. We're not going to do away with the English language, but we're going to add a second language to them. And it can be done. French immersion schools are doing it. Why can't we? So that's all I have to say about that.